Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in 3, 2, 1. On this week's show, we have our thoughts on Ant-Man and the Wasp. Will Anthem bring EA back into gamers' good graces? And we honor a comic book legend. All this and more as we once again delve into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the pop culture cosmos. And we're back with another episode of the pop culture cosmos. My name is Gerald from Pop Culture Cosmos and Game Source. We truly appreciate you tuning in to our show each and every week. But it wouldn't be a Pop Culture Cosmos without my good friend. He is the main man of Humanica Media. You got to check out all the great things that are going on with Humanica Media on YouTube, all their shows on Podbean, Spotify, and so much more. It's my good friend. It's a much better sounding Josh Peterson. What's going on, my friend? Hey, hey, hey. Uh, thanks, man. Nice to uh, be back on the show. You're going to talk some Ant-Man. I'm probably not going to listen. Happy Monday. If you get a chance, check out our PCC Multiverse, our Friday show. This man gutted it through, but just made sure I did not ask him to do any karaoke. That's for sure. But it's going to be a great show we have for everyone out there. We've got a lot to talk about, including what's coming up for EA when it comes to their auspicious game that's being made by the folks at Bioware called Anthem. We're going to talk about that for a little bit and see if that's the game that's going to get EA back because they've been really on the outs with the gamers when it comes to public relations and things of that nature. So we're going to be talking some Anthem coming up here in the show. Also as well, we're going to pay tribute to a comic book legend, Steve Ditko, who passed away This past week at the age of 90, we're going to talk about his contributions to the comic book realm and also what his efforts have meant to the MCU. We've also got from E3 2018, our final interviews that we have in the bank for you. We've got Douglas Hoyabu from Retro City Games. He's going to be interviewing the the folks at Mixer, talking about that great streaming service to see how well it matches up in the marketplace from E3 2018. Speaking of E3 2018, Josh, I know you got something coming up that you recorded that's just out of embargo. It just lifted. What are we going to debut for you on the show today? Uh, I got an interview with Rin Vickers of 704 Games. We're talking about NASCAR Heat 3. And, you know, as we've discussed, there is a surprisingly large amount of fans that are really into this game. You know, I put it up on YouTube yesterday and it's already hitting some pretty high numbers. So, yeah, definitely stay tuned if you're into that. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. I'm sure they would love to listen in too. Absolutely. If you're into NASCAR at all, check out our interview coming up later in the show as well. But first, Josh, it is Ant-Man and the Wasp. It has debuted out in theaters here domestically. It's being rolled out gradually worldwide. It's already garnered close to $80 million in its first weekend, which is a solid hit for Marvel. Since this is the last Marvel entry of the year, we can pretty much say at this point, it looks like they've had three solid to great hits on their hands. And well, first Black Panther blew it over a billion dollars easy. Infinity War over $2 billion there. Both of those did extremely well. And by all reports that are coming out there, Ant-Man and the Wasp doing solid numbers. It's getting also very good reviews, nice Metacritic rating and Rotten Tomatoes rating as well. You're going to head to see it tomorrow. I've actually seen it already, but before I talk about and review with my thoughts on the movie itself, 
and before you go turn off your headphone and go la 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 so you don't want to hear what i have to say what are your expectations as you go into the theater tomorrow to go see ant-man and the wasp i honestly i don't have any expectations going into it uh we've kind of talked about this a few times but I just want to be, you know, I want to see the the missing link between Infinity War Part 1 and 2, and I want to know what Ant-Man's been up to, and I'm hoping there's a little business about Hawkeye. But yeah, I just, I want to be entertained. You know, I'm I'm not expecting a, a deep story. I like the first one because it was more, uh, you know, it had a different style, it was more a uh, like a heist movie, so I don't really know what to expect from this one, but I just, I'm hoping it's good. Um, you know, I'm going in, you know, like I said, no expectations. So that way I won't be disappointed because I'm not expecting anything out of it. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to avoid as much as I can in the way of spoilers for the movie. But I know I might bleed into some of it as far as what I'm going to be talking about. I know as far as the movie itself, there's a lot to talk about and if there's any correlation. So I'm probably going to be bleeding into spoiler territory. I don't think there's going to be any way to avoid it. So if you just want to go ahead and if you're listening to us on any one of our podcast networks, just fast forward it just a few minutes, go ahead and do that. If you're listening to it on FM radio or any one of our awesome radio networks, just go ahead and just turn it down the volume just a little bit. If you don't want to hear any possible spoilers, because I don't think there's going to be any way to talk about the movie in general lengths then you know obviously going into a little bit of spoilers so here goes nothing and josh has already actually turned off his headphones and he's already saying la 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 i can't hear you i can't hear you because he doesn't want to be spoiled at all he's managed to do a great job of avoiding the internet and social media because it's already out there as far as all that stuff. It's just amazing what all these entities out there have as far as already knowing the spoilers, already having that up. So people just will even you know, accidentally just running into as far as spoilers are concerned. So he's done a great job of avoiding them. So Josh is not listening now. So I can go ahead and elaborate more on my thoughts on Ant-Man and the Wasp. Here we go. All right. First off. Was it a good movie? I will tell you this, that it was a pretty darn good movie. It was not to the level of Black Panther or Infinity War. It just really was a cool movie to watch. But I think because of the small scale, and I was explaining this to someone earlier, that because of its small scale, I really think that it can never be in the lowest echelon of the Marvel films nor the highest echelon, because I think it's just limited in the scope of what it can do because it's, it's just filmed and just the story, the plot line is just dealt with on such a small scale. It's concentrated in and around the Bay area, San Francisco area of California. You know, you're not going to get a globe trotting story. You're not going to get a planet to planet story whenever you're dealing with Ant-Man and the Wasp here or the original Ant-Man for that matter. So you're going to get a, probably what's some movie that's, that for most people that's going to be in somewhere in the middle of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And that's pretty much where it's going to be for me. If you want to get a better idea of my list of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it's available now at popculturecosmos.wordpress.com. I will be updating it at some point with this movie, but it will be in my top 10 of the MCU because I thought it was a really cool flick. I will say this. If you are looking for the film to answer a lot of questions in regards to upcoming for the next Avengers movie, you're not going to be able to find much of it. If you miss three lines of dialogue, basically, that are just spoken almost offhandedly, then you're probably going to be able to just realize that, hey, this is just a self-contained movie because there's just three lines of dialogue that give anything away to a possible theory or theories behind how the rest of the Avengers that are still alive at this point in time that made it through Avengers Infinity War can actually go ahead and try and get out of the current predicament that the universe is in right now, thanks to Thanos and Avengers Infinity War. And there was a great line that somebody added. (laughs) There are two cutscenes after ending one of them, one of the best lines of the, the actual film 
while I was watching was actually made by a member of the audience, but I'll have to elaborate on that down the road because that even gives away more. But if you think it needs to be an essential part of your Marvel Cinematic Universe watching, it's not. You can watch the next Avengers coming up without having seen this film, and they'll probably just explain it to you within the first five or ten minutes anyways of what's going on, and so you can catch up real easily. But should you see Ant-Man and the Wasp? I definitely think you should because this is a fun flick. It is one of the funniest movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It doesn't take itself seriously, which I think is a really good thing. And for the most part, it allows Paul Rudd to be a comedian. It allows Michael Pena to steal almost every scene that he's in. And those two with their comedic talents are really good. Evangeline Lilly is really strong as a character as the Wasp in this film. It's really giving her a chance to shine, and she does so very well. If you're looking for a lot of Michelle Pfeiffer in this movie, who plays Hope Van Dien, uh, you're not going to get as much as you like because she doesn't end up being in the movie until the latter stages, although she does make her presence felt when she's in the movie. So just want to give you a heads up on that. Michael Douglas, he does actually a pretty good job as well in the movie. He is central to a lot of things going on within the film. But again, it's all centralized. It's all self-contained pretty much. And it's, it's still on such a smaller scale compared to even the other movies like Captain America Winter Soldier, Captain America First Avenger, or whatnot that are a little bit smaller compared to the planet-hopping movies of the Thor movies or the Avengers movies. But it's still no less a, a outstanding film that people should watch. It is of the three movies that have come out this year by Marvel. It is number three, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It is actually a really fun film, a really strong film. If I'm rating it on our star system that we use at popculturecosmos.wordpress.com, I'm going to give it four out of five stars. It's a really strong film. Like I said, about an eight out of 10. And it's a really fun film to watch. Very funny. Very, very funny. I think a lot of people are going to like it. A lot of scene stealing in that movie. There's some individuals in there who didn't get enough screen time. I think when it comes to Ghost, her character was not introduced very well. I would have liked a better explanation or, or given her some more screen time on that. Lawrence Fishburne, I think a little bit of the same too. I think he is of importance down the road, but it also would have been nice if he would have been able to get more screen time in this movie as well. But for the most part, like I said, there, there's just little nitpicky things to talk about here and there. But for the most part, this is a fun, self-contained, very funny movie to watch. I think you'll enjoy it. I think this is a movie that's going to be a favorite for people watching on TV for years to come. But why wait for that? Why wait for the streaming services? Check it out today in the theaters. You'll be glad you did. I give it a thumbs up right now. Like I said, four out of five stars for me. And that is Ant-Man of the Wasp. Go check it out. I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll be glad you did. I get to give Josh the thumbs up sign. He can come back on the air. Your la 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 is done. We good. And Yes, yes. And then uh, I guess the, well, the only thing I said, and I've told you this earlier, there are two cut scenes just to tell everybody out there. So stay around with them. One last thing, just to tell everybody out there, the cut scenes, if you don't pay attention, you will miss something that might lead into something that might help the fight in Avengers Infinity War. But like I said, it's, it's very offhanded and it's more so about the effects of the movie itself. The movie itself takes place just before the events of Avengers Infinity War. The cutscenes themselves, well, they're pretty much self-explanatory what time frame they're at. So, Otherwise, like I said, it's a really solid movie to watch, and I recommend it wholeheartedly. Okay, my friend, you're back. You, you, you've got the headphones on. Like I said, my friend, it, I think you'll, you'll have a great time when you're watching it. All right, cool. It's garnered about $80 million at the U.S. domestic box office this past weekend. It is easily the 20th. Now, get that. The 20th straight Marvel number one hit domestically here at the box office in its first week out. Just great signs for Marvel. And it does 
mean that, well, we're going to be playing a lot more guessing games when it comes to Captain Marvel and also Avengers Infinity War coming in 2019. What are your thoughts out there on Ant-Man and the Wasp? Have you gone to see it? Did you enjoy it like I did? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook and Twitter as well. Like I said, we've got a lot of great things to talk about. Coming up, we've got E3 2018 interviews. We've got two of them to finish everything off there. We're going to be talking about Anthem, the passing of comic book legend Steve Ditko, and so much more. But first, it's our good friend Chad and Hyperschmidt. This is about to win. And this is the Pop Culture Cosmos. Waiting just to see the light When did this become a fight? Struggle just to fill my lungs with air Staring at the finish line The darkness running out of time I'll do what it takes to get you there Listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Mm, nothing's better when grilling your favorite meal than adding some delicious Wheelie Q rubs, seasonings, and gluten free barbecue sauce. Made with the finest ingredients, Wheelie Q products pack a ton of flavor to your meals, whether it's ribs, chicken, steak, hamburgers, fries, or vegetables. To get your hands on some of these tasty Wheelie Q items, head on over to www.wheelieq.com and a portion of all profits made will go into finding a cure for spinal muscular atrophy. Pop Culture Cosmos listeners, act now and get 15% off your order just by entering the promo code POD1, that's P-O-D and the number one at checkout. For the tastiest food on the grill, 
Nothing's better than Wheelie Q items today at wheelieq.com. And we're back with another episode of the Cosmic Crossfire. It's Gerald coming right back at you here. But it wouldn't be a Cosmic Crossfire without my good friend. He is the traveling man today. It is my good friend from Rob McCallum Films. You got to check out all the great things that are going on with his awesome experience known as Rob McCallum Films with Box Art, the Kitty documentary, the He-Man documentary, Power of Grayskull coming up, and so much more by checking out today on robmccallumfilms.com, Rob McCallum Films on Facebook, and at Rob McZob on Twitter. It's my good friend. It is Rob McCallum. Busy man. Busy man. Busy day today, my friend. A lot going on, but uh, that is just another day, I suppose, in life. It just depends on where the busyness is coming from. We are getting set to move, and it goes on when you move from place to place, and we got moving from a house to another house, so lots of packing, lots of paperwork. It's happening, but there's always time for the crossfire, I hope. But we're here to talk today about pop culture, and I know you're extremely busy, and we truly appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, but pray tell, Rob. What's in your mind when it comes to pop culture? The most buzzed about director's cut has a little bit more information now in the pipeline, Gerald. This possibly is the most sought after director's cut that has never been released. I don't know why, but here's the, here's the skinny. Apparently an artist who worked on Justice League has confirmed that there is a Zack Snyder cut for the film. Again, do we care? Are we just hoping that this cut exists so that the film can't be as bad as it actually is and can only be better. In fact, can't any other cut of the film actually make it better by existing in opposition to what has been released? I did watch Justice League last week on the off chance. And no wonder we didn't talk for four days while you grieved. There you go. But it's okay with movie. I think it's much. I think it's better than BBS and also Man of Steel, in my opinion. I know you wow. think otherwise. Wow. But- I, wow. You we, see? Should, we should just send the segment in the show right here because you don't have any credibility for what comes out of your mouth next. Oh, no, After making that statement, Justice League is better than Man of Steel and Batman versus wow. Superman. I think All you're right. still talking about a 6 out of 10. No, no. Okay, here we go. Keep going. So, I've somehow tuned you out after that magnificent statement you just made. Well, you know, you and I seem to agree on everything. Not You, you know I, it. Yes, yes. But I, I will say this that it, there is plenty of room for improvement with that film. And I mean plenty, <laughs> but it, to me, it was all right. It, it's just an all right film. And uh, it, like I said, I watched it, you know, again last week and thought it was a little bit better the second time around, but it still has its issues. So if there is a cut out there that can make it better by all means, because it does emulate the Marvel Cinematic Universe way too much. There are some UG moments, but there's also some cool moments too. I, I like some of the, uh, the banter back and forth. I thought that was pretty entertaining. I really think there is a connection between the Wonder Woman character and the Batfleck, which is going to be a shame because we're no longer probably going to see the Batfleck anymore and see that develop because they want to make a younger Batman now. I, I just thought it was, like I said, there were some signs there of hope, but like we know from all, all the domestic box office, the worldwide box office receipts that it just wasn't something that the folks wanted to see in mass at least as much as any of the other movies that have come out recently in the DC universe. Okay. I'm going to cling to one thing that you said there. Just just one, just just one one for now, just one for now. If you can make a better cut of this film by all means, does that mean you're prepared to give another two and a half hours or longer of your life to this film? That's only okay. You've already given five hours of your life, more than a half a work day, and you're ready to give it another two and a half hour, three hours hoping that it's better and for a film that's just okay why not why not because there's so many things to watch out there gerald you know this i know this we talk about that repeatedly have you seen this have you not seen this what's next in your queue we know there is a ton of content out there i don't have time or a place on my list for a second version of a film that was only okay even if i wanted to agree with you that it was a six out of ten or a three out of five i'm not saying i am because i don't agree that even if I wanted to, I don't have time for a second chance film that I didn't love enough the first time. I'm still waiting for that four-hour director's cut of Blade Runner 2049. 
I still got to check that out. That's on my list. And I guarantee the first version of that will be way ahead of any recut Zack Snyder director's cut of Justice League. Well, which cut of the Blade Runner? That's for sure, because there's so many out there. In fact, maybe there's even ones that we haven't seen. All likely. All likely. What else is interesting in the in the talk of spinoffs and other movies is an Optimus Prime spinoff has been suggested now in the wake of Bumblebee getting his own standalone film. There's reports that Optimus Prime will get his own spinoff movie. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, don't the Transformer films already feel like the Optimus Prime show? Why do we need a spinoff of Optimus when the six films or whatever are pretty much only focus on him as the main robot? All I hear when you say that is in the back of my head, Shia LaBeouf just screaming it so annoyingly, Optimus, Optimus. Why would you go ahead and do a spinoff on him when, like you said, he's it's been so centralized in all these films and he's been the cornerstone of all of them. Well, but that was, uh, I think that was the week when we had like seven new trailers drop, Bumblebee versus Lego Movie 2, the sequel. In which we liked better for whatever reasons. We never got around to it because I think we ran short one week on yeah. like International Trailer Day on that one Friday. And both of those trailers dropped along with How to Train Your Dragon 3 and I- Immortal Machines or whatever that was. They all dropped on, on the same day. But those two I thought were really interesting because they were spun off from an existing film. So I'll throw it to you now. Which movie are you more excited for? Lego Movie 2, given what you've seen, or Bumblebee? Well, Lego Movie 2 didn't even really like look that good, but I would put it miles ahead of Bumblebee because I have zero desire to see Bumblebee. Absolutely zero because I am done with the Transformer franchise. It's just, it's been played out. It's done. There's a reason why the numbers kept sliding down and down and down and even more down with each and every one. It's just that it's done. I did love the Lego movie when it came out. I thought that was really enjoyable. But so far, I've not seen anything to really impress me when it comes to the Lego movie, too, as well. I got to tell you, on paper, I would agree 100%. But Rob McCallum does always a little bit of digging about what's going on here. I thought the Lego movie 2 looked, or part 2, or whatever it's called, felt really boring. Nothing felt fresh. Felt like like an extended joke that had already hit its punchline. It was digging and hoping for more laughs. It just feels like it's not going to be what the first one was. Hope it does well for everybody involved. Just not, I'm not excited. For me, it's like Deadpool too, because that's when I saw, that's exactly what I was thinking. But then I started looking at Bumblebee and it really starts. Well, we'll start with this, the nostalgia factor. Transformer fans are going to love the fact that you have a Bumblebee movie with the original Volkswagen bug car that Bumblebee was known for. Back in Generation 1, the original Transformers cartoon and, and toy. So the, he's going to love, they're, they're all going to love that. All the fans are going to love that. But what really got me is the director. Travis Knight is directing the Bumblebee spinoff. Now, Travis Knight, if you don't know that name, he is a critically acclaimed artist that works for Leica, the stop motion company behind Coraline, and he directed Kubo in the Two Strings. Both of those films are really excellent for me. They have really great storytelling and an emotional through line that kind of resonates around the world. And for that reason alone, I'm much more interested in Bumblebee more than any other Transformer film, should I say. Travis Knight is the reason that I would eventually check out Bumblebee. I'm not going to race to the theater to see it, but I definitely will check it out because of uh, who's in charge there. Let me ask you this, though. From what I've seen, it looks like just a normal setup for every other Transformer movie that's been out there. What do you think that's going to be different that he's going to be bringing to the Transformer mix, and you know, especially in the case of Bumblebee? I think there's going to be much like uh, Jurassic World had that relationship with Blue and uh, Chris Pratt's character. I think you're going to see a, a really solid relationship between Bumblebee and the girl that's the lead character. I think you're going to find that there is that sort of human pet dichotomy and relationship going on, but then it's going to evolve a little bit more than that. And I think that's going to be what uh, anchors the story all the way through. Okay. I'll take your word for it. If, if it does prove to be something special, then, then you know what? I may even check it out when it hits uh, a home video standard, because I, as of now, I have a home video it. stand. You're just going to go down to the corner with a guy selling papers for two no, bits no, just, and check know, out the home video stand. 
home video standard, I said, as oh, far okay. as uh, streaming. You're all <laughs> ready to jump on me today. I I'm ready you. to go. Yes, you must have way too much coffee, my friend. Lots of coffee. Lots of coffee. Well, we truly appreciate you swigging back a couple of cups before you came on the show and appreciate your inspired performance right here in the Cosmic Crossfire. I'm inspired by our, our discussion today. I'm inspired to quit talking about pop culture for another week. Fair enough. Fair enough. Rob, it's always so great to have you on the show. And of course, a part of the Cosmic Crossfire right here on the Pop Culture Cosmos. Rob McCallum Films is back with a vengeance. This year, we're set to release Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, which chronicles the ultimate 80s billion dollar franchise, Masters of the Universe. See exclusive interviews and hear untold stories from the people responsible for creating the world of Eternia, a place full of magic and science, and learn about the craft of creating action figures and animation. Power of Grayskull drops this year and is just one of our many projects at Rob McCallum Films. And we're back with the Pop Culture Cosmos. This is Cheryl Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos and Game Source. Thank you so much for tuning into our show, and we truly appreciate everything that you do for us as far as listening to our great programming. If you want to check out a listing of all of our shows, when they're playing, where they're playing, because we are being played all around the world seven days a week on online radio stations in the U.S., Canada, the U.K., and Australia, or you want to check us out on over-the-air FM radio or any one of our over 30 podcast networks, we've got a scheduled listing right there for you. And that's going to be at Pop Culture Cosmos on Facebook or Pop Culture Cosmo on Twitter. Josh, I know you got a lot of great things going on with Humanica Media. So give us the lowdown, my friend. What is going on with Humanica Media? Just new topic oculus. That's it. You can catch the last episode now if you want to on Podbean. And then there's a new one going up tomorrow morning, which you can definitely check out. I don't actually know what it's about yet because I haven't edited, but um yeah, it's going to be good. And also Podcast Radio Network. When are we on, Gerald? Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on the Podcast Radio Network for Attack of the Humanicans. We're on Mondays and Fridays on the Podcast Radio Network. And we're also, like I said, seven days a week on online radio. And you can always find us on Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and over 30 different podcast outlets. My friend... I know you've gotten a chance to check out a lot of the action so far when it comes to Anthem. You know, I know it was shown off heavily at E3 2018. I know it garnered a lot of critical praise and awards as far as from the outlets that got a chance to see it up close and personal. They just showed off the 20-minute primer that they showed to the press at E3 2018. They just transferred that video and made it available to the public. Got a chance to look at it myself. I know you've got a chance to take a look at Anthem and what it's all about. Before I get into my thoughts with the game, what are your thoughts with Anthem in regards to maybe being a bounce back for EA after the Mass Effect Andromeda Star Wars game, uh, single player story, and and everything that seemed to be going on, Battlefront 2, and all that drama that EA itself has created? Tell us your thoughts on Anthem. Honestly, like I know a lot of people who are super excited to play the game. I'm not. You know, there are just far too many games like that out there already. So I don't know what they're going to offer me that I can't get elsewhere. And the fact that you have to play it with people, I don't know. It bothers me. And like I, I think EA is they have pretty much destroyed Bioware. Bioware is a story oriented there. A studio known for story-oriented games, they're not good with multiplayer games. You know, everyone's super stoked about Anthem, but I feel like it's going to be like, you know, some of the many other games that were big titles at E3, but then kind of faded into the bargain bin within the first two years that it was out. I, I think the combat looks cool. And, you know, the fact that your buddies can, you know, you and your buddies can basically take, it's like, it reminds me a lot of, it's like, a reminds me of a mixture of Monster Hunter and... Uh, for me, it reminds me a lot of Destiny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what do you think? Because honestly, like, I, I'm not excited. There's so many games I'd rather see Bioware make than this. And like, the moment that I heard Bioware's new Dragon Age game is going to feature the same thing with like a big multiplayer, uh, you know, 
adding content on as they go. Like I just EA has has just dug a hole and I don't think that they're ever going to be able to get out of it. And I think BioWare is kind of the the anchor attack, not anchor, but you know, they're just kind of the innocent victim on the ship as it sinks. Well, first off, I know a lot of their harsh feelings on single player content came as a result of their debacle with Mass Effect Andromeda. I can pretty much tell you that they took their displeasure on single player games and single player narratives out on a what probably would have been a great Star Wars game that the studio headed by Uncharted creator Amy Hennig and what she was developing. They basically canceled that game right out late last year and they also go ahead and uh, canceled out the studio. She's currently forming her own independent studio i believe at this point in time but still i honestly like i think the whole thing is ea's fault though like with with mass effect mass effect failed because they took all of the people that were supposed to be working on mass effect put them on star wars and star wars wasn't even you know it wasn't even that great if they would have just left them on mass effect and not ruin the legacy of such a great video game series not only would Bioware not have a bad reputation, but I think people would hate EA less. They were, for at least two, three years straight, the most hated company in all of the U.S. But they were turning around that in good favor with the fans. They were starting to get really good vibes from the fans as far as their overall outlook. But like you said, in 2017 was a turn for the worse with all their poor decisions there. And it looks like it's continuing With Anthem, this is supposed to be one of their benchmark games that they're looking forward to when it releases in early 2019. A game that's supposed to have this central hub area where you go for storylines and missions and things of that nature. And then you go out into the world itself with three co-op players so you can play up to four people at one time. Then you go out and tackle the missions there. You tackle whatever wildlife or monsters that are out there or other space alien races or whatever that you meet out there. To me, like I said, it blends a lot of what Destiny is all about already. And like you said, there's stuff that's already been out there that that do similar things. I'm not in love with it either, but I know a lot of money and a lot of backing is behind Anthem. Otherwise, they would not be giving it as much hype and as much promise as they are trying to give it. I know they're writing a lot on their early year hopes of 2019 on Anthem. And to me, that's quite a concern because like you said, Mass Effect Andromeda should have been given this kind of love. The Mass Effect series as a whole should have been given this kind of love. And it's a shame if we'll never see the Mass Effect series reignited again. That's a terrible thing if that's the case. But we can hold hope that Anthem is actually going to be something more than what you and I are expecting. But I will say this. They are treating it like a AAA game. They are treating it like a top shelf game and something that they want to commit to for at least the short term in a big, big way. But if it fails, this is bad. Like that. that's it. And there's no like EA will... I think, you know, besides sports, I don't think that EA will ever be able to venture outside of the sport genre again. And I, it's or outside of Battlefield or outside of Battlefield. But here's the thing. Even Lucasfilms is looking to find somebody else to develop their games. So everything's up in the air and, you know, things are even up in the air at Lucasfilm right now. But I know there's like a 10 year contract that they signed, I think, in, in 2015. So but you're right if there's a performance issue if it doesn't meet up to standards either quality wise or performance wise i'm sure there there i'm sure there are clauses in there that lucasfilm can find an out on if they want to go ahead and switch development studios on their future ea game uh, on their future star wars games right and you know here's here's another thing too like like i mentioned before bioware is the indentured servant on the the boat that is ea and if ea if that goes down then bioware is just an innocent victim of it all but they can't that's it like they can't do anything so ea has effectively you know their hatred of single player games i think has it's a plague and it has ruined bioware like one of the greatest story driven game companies out there today and like honestly like i don't see anthem pulling the numbers that they thought that it would i see it being another case of 
Lost Planet, where everyone put was like, oh, this game looks amazing. It's going to be so great. And then it ends up not performing well. I remember seeing it at E3 before it debuted with Capcom, because Capcom, I believe, was the publisher of it. And it looked really like something that had a lot of promise. And unfortunately, after, what, two or three iterations, it really just turned out not to be the case. Yeah, well, even right off the bat, the reviews weren't that great. Like it was, they were expecting it to get nines and tens, but ended up getting sixes and sevens. This is true. And I mean, you got to admit, they are building the hype on this game and they have done a very solid job, even with the backlash from BioWare as far as Mass Effect Andromeda and what you're talking about when it comes to Dragon Age Inquisition. They are still doing an admirable job of being able to promote anthem as something that is garnering a lot of hype whether we like it or not whether we have favorable opinions at this point or not they are doing a very solid job of making it a top shelf triple a game whether or not the execution is there is still up for grabs is still wait and see i am not endearing myself to the game as of this point but i could be turned around if i think it's going to be something worth looking at But I agree with you on that as far as their position with Bioware in recent past and their position on single-player games and single-player narratives as a whole has been disappointing. And with a lot of fans like you and I who really just enjoy single-player narratives for whatever reasons that that we enjoy playing them, it just seems like it's been disappointing their whole attitude when it comes to the single-player narrative. Yeah, and that bothers me. I I have no goodwill towards them whatsoever, and I am maybe the game will be good. I'm sure some of my friends will pick it up, but I just I have no interest in playing it at this moment in time. Well, hopefully they can turn around the minds of both you and I because if Anthem is a bust and you lose the Star Wars license, that is a really hard and difficult thing for Electronic Arts, aka EA to go through because Then you have a situation there where you only have FIFA, you only have Madden as you really two Star Wars, and you've got the Battlefield series. That's it as far as quality games that you've got continually producing. Otherwise, you have smaller games that have done pretty good in some cases, but not to the point where it's going to pick up the losses for what you did for Mass Effect Andromeda, and maybe some others, including, well, Star Wars Battlefront 2, which has not met up to sales expectations, and also possibly Anthem, if that fails in early 2019. What are your thoughts out there on Anthem? Did you like what you saw? Because we really want to be convinced that Anthem is a game worth playing, and we really love to hear your thoughts, why you are really looking forward to Anthem as being that next AAA game that will reinstate the fans' faith in electronic arts. Please share us your thoughts with us, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook and Twitter as well. Coming up next, we've got two great interviews for you from E3 2018. We've got Douglas Hoibu at the Mixer booth, and then also we've got Chad Smith and Josh Peterson talking to the folks at 704 Studios regarding their upcoming game, NASCAR He3. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. Greetings, wrestling fans. This is Dave Dynasty, host of the Dave Dynasty Show, the podcast that every week brings you nearly two hours of pro wrestling goodness from the Midwest. We feature interviews with the legends of the past, stars of today, and the prospects of tomorrow. We have segments that feature classic wrestling audio, whole episodes devoted to the history of Midwest pro wrestling, and much, much more. Do not miss an episode of the Dave Dynasty Show. We are available on all podcast platforms, or you can access past episodes and all of our social media links by visiting DaveDynasty.com. Be good, be safe, and keep on growing. Hey guys, this is Doug from Pop Culture Cosmos, and I'm here with Ben from the streaming company Mixer. 
we were talking about his streaming service and the company he works for. If you want to give us a, a little rundown of what Mixer is and you know what they do and yeah. where you guys are around. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. So, yeah, as you mentioned, Mixer is a live streaming service. We like to think of the stuff that we're working on right now as sort of the future of live game streaming. Um, so we've bet really big on interactive. And so making viewers and streamers having an experience together that's different than just chatting and watching. And so we have a whole uh, set of tools where viewers can press buttons and actually change the game of uh, the gameplay of the streamer itself. Uh, for example, in Minecraft, you can pretty much summon any element in the Minecraft game and have it pop up in the streamer's world while they're streaming the game. And so we're working really hard with game developers and publishers to create these new types of streaming experiences that go beyond just watching content and instead kind of blur the lines between playing as well. But at the same time, we're invested really much in a lot of other differentiating features in the viewing space. We have a feature called co-streaming that allows streamers to join their streams up to four at one time. So you basically have a quad box experience where you're seeing everybody on the screen streaming at one time. This is perfect for games like PUBG, Fortnite, squad-based games where you want to see a perspective of each person in the match itself. And it really adds that sort of differentiated viewing experience that you can't get on other platforms. Um, and lastly, another feature that we've really invested heavily in what we we love about as well is, is called hype zone and so hype zone uh, uses an advanced machine learning to detect streamers across mixer that are streaming in very intense like exciting moments so we have this channel for fortnite we have this channel for PUBG, for realm royale and rainbow six and basically if you're a streamer on mixer and you have five players left in your in your fortnite game we know that we can detect it and we will automatically host you on our hype zone channel so you can go from zero viewers never had more than five to all of a sudden thousands of people are watching you at the most intense moment of your Fortnite game cheering you on ready to see if you can get that victory royale and it's really good for streamers who are just kind of getting started and trying to grow an audience and, and, and find their space on the platform to you know get in front of a you know people that really love that type of content right away well I know I own a as well as doing this I own a retro video game store in Vegas yeah. and a lot of my customers and stuff like that they, they want to be a streamer and they they see twitch as this big daunting untouchable thing almost like YouTube yeah. where I feel like mixers become that that new approachable like yeah. as far as like on the ground level of it people come in talking about mixer I don't hear as much about twitch I, I know that probably makes you happy but it seems like those are the things you're doing right is that something you're gonna implement into more games or or expand on as far as like the, you know the viewer dump or the the hype moments you guys are talking yeah, about exactly I mean so to be clear like we want to we're all about community like we want to make sure that our community is a positive welcoming place that anybody can get started to get become a part of um, I think you talked about like getting started with streaming we've made it really easy so we've integrated directly into Xbox one we've put it integrated directly into Windows 10 and we have apps on iOS and Android that let anybody basically become a streamer in just two or three clicks and so you don't have to download software you don't have to buy very expensive streaming PCs and hardware kits like it's all there you can get started and easy to go and with our discoverability tools that I kind of just mentioned like with hype zone if you're playing Fortnite and you're doing well in Fortnite like you have as equal of a chance to get in front of thousands of people than someone who is already established on Mixer because we're not discriminating based off of just like your status on the platform itself we're trying to make sure that people can find you discover you and be part of your community as well the part of Mixer community well that's awesome guys thank you Ben I hope you guys got a uh, better sense of what Mixer is and what they're doing for the community and uh, how the future of streaming is going to go yeah. alright thanks for talking with me you're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Hey, what's up? This is Chad at E3 2018. I'm here at 704 Games with Ren Vigors. Ren, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? Nice. Good. Thanks hey. for coming out. Oh, thank you so much. We're so excited to be here. We were just playing your brand new video game. Yep. Do you guys want to give them in like two minutes, tell them a little something about the game that they're going to be seeing this year compared sure. to last year? Sure. And tell, tell them just about the game, yeah. Right on, yeah. So uh, we're, we're here showcasing NASCAR E3. It comes out September 7th on the uh, Xbox One, PS4, and PC. And our, our main improvements are we still have a 40-car multiplayer, but what we're doing is we're adding in tournament and competitive type features and leaderboards. Uh, and then in our career mode, we have developed a fantasy we're calling it the Extreme Dirt Tour, so it's a fantasy starting point for players to work through eight different dirt tracks, a whole season of dirt racing uh, to then lead into the NASCAR uh, Truck Series K-12 
Camping World Truck Series, the uh, NASCAR Xfinity Series, and then the NASCAR Monster Energy Series. Now, real quick, I want to stop you on the dirt track real quick. Sure. We were, we were playing it back earlier, and you were saying that it's not just tracks that people are like used to. You've yep. got some fantasy tracks in there, yep. some cool stuff like that. You want to touch base on that a little bit more? Absolutely. Yes. It's, uh, it's eight tracks total, and it's a mix between fantasy ovals, there's a fantasy road course, and then there are real world dirt tracks that we've got in there. Uh, and then we've got these hybrid, is what I'm calling them, tracks that are that are real world asphalt tracks that we put dirt on. Okay, cool. Well, um, a one really cool thing that stood out to me was in the game, uh, just like in real life, you know, most of us aren't going to get the chance to go about 200 miles an hour in a car, but this game takes you pretty close of, to the life of a real NASCAR driver. Yep. You have these cool options for how you want to set up your car, and you give the people just so many options. Things I've just like didn't, wouldn't even have thought of if I was trying to come up with the game. Do you want to tell them more about like the difference of, of if you're someone that loves to really dig and you know your stuff versus sure. you're brand new to this and you just want to you just want to race? Yes, yes. So if you're an experienced racer, we have stability controls that you can turn off, and once you turn those off, it opens up customization op options for car setup, and so you can you can spend a lot of time changing tire pressures mm -hmm. and gear ratios and yeah. you know I mean it's it's there are a lot of options that and, you can adjust but and we also give you the option to just use one of our nine predefined car setups yeah. um, and I was gonna say your the way that how quickly you can jump in and out of practice and like switch is up it makes it really like hassle free to just like okay I want to just test this and go and so it's yep. just like it's really easy you don't have to wait for it to like a bunch of time for it to load so it, that's I like that Thank I appreciate you. that that's great yeah. Awesome. yeah. And then in career, we also have the ability, once you've earned enough money, you can purchase a team and, uh, and, and, and have some owner-type <laughs> tasks where you know, you're hiring personnel or yeah. upgrades or things like that. That's so tight. Cool. Well, I mean, definitely check out this game, you guys. Josh, you were saying something? Oh, uh, what's the release window? What's going to be the release window on that? We are releasing September 7th on Xbox One, PS4, and PC. Nice. Cool. Awesome. Do you have any plans for Nintendo Switch with this at all? Not currently. Okay, cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's been a such a pleasure, you guys. Take Let care. us play these awesome games. We were swerving around on the track. Usually, most of the time, I used to just like turn around on the Daytona 500 and ram my friends. This game, we were having so much fun with it. The handling is great. The way that the draft feels is really, really fun. It's really intuitive. So you guys have to check this out. It's going to be awesome, and we'll see you guys later. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're tired of sifting through flea markets for rare and unique games, we can help. Retro City Games in Henderson, Nevada, only five minutes from the Las Vegas Strip, has all your favorite gaming staples, classics, and a wide selection of rare games with new stuff always appearing on our shelves. Come in and chat with Nicole or Doug about your love of games and watch as they help you complete your collection or find your childhood favorite. And don't forget, Retro City Games loves trade-ins. So if you have any Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, Xbox, PlayStation, or even PC games, come in and visit Retro City Games today. Welcome to the new metropolis of gaming, Retro City Games. And we're back to close out the show. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. We truly appreciate you tuning in to this week's broadcast. Josh, just want to make sure everybody knows out there, we did have a major loss in pop culture last week. Steve Ditko, who was the co-creator of two of the most important characters right now in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and also in the Marvel comic book universe as well. He did pass away at the age of 90. It was a very unfortunate loss in the comic book and also as well the pop culture community. He was the creator, the co-creator, I should say, along with Stan Lee, uh, Spider-Man and Doctor Strange are some of his more notable creations. He did create many other characters within both the DC and Marvel universes, but obviously when it comes to importance, it all starts with Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. I did hear about that, yes. You know what always makes me sad about Steve Ditko is the fact that there's a lot that went on behind the scenes that we'll never be privy to because he did very few interviews and he was kind of, he's very reclusive even after he left Marvel and started doing his own thing. I know he had a uh, brief stint at DC, but yeah, there's kind of a, a falling out there and we'll never really know what happened between the two of them. I wonder just how many people know who Steve Ditko is and what he did. I know he's not solely responsible for the creation of Spider-Man, but you know he did a lot of drawing and he helped uh, create Doctor Strange. 
it's a name you don't hear a lot because you mostly hear about Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and and you see his name flash on there, but it's so quick most people don't even recognize it when they see any Spider Man movie or any Doctor Strange movie as well. Right, correct. So it, it, there's just a history there that not a lot of people know about. Obviously, the big fa- comic book fans know, and it's become a he's kind of a pop culture icon. But he kind of reminds me of um, Halliday in Ready Player One. You know, they they had that big uh, him and the other guy had that big fight, and then uh, one of them retreated from the world. Didn't really talk to anyone until right before his death. But I, I'm glad that he's getting remembered for what he for you know his accomplishments, and it's. Even if it has to happen posthumous, I hope that people actually do some research to find out what he did and what kind of effect that he did have on the comic book world. Well, you're right. Even if it does come posthumously, that it's still at least we're remembering him and the contributions he made to the pop culture universe, which start and pretty much well are focused on the creations that he did along with Stan Lee of Dr. Strange and of course, Spider-Man. The only thing at this point in time, if he were still alive and I got a chance to interview, I just would ask if he was proud of, especially with those two characters. I hope he was. I sincerely hope he was with where they've gone, both in the comic book world and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But I cannot thank him enough for all of his contributions, for all of his characters, but especially Spider-Man and Dr. Strange. So our best thoughts to his family, our condolences, and our prayers go out to you, to the family of Steve Ditko, the co-creator of Doctor Strange and Spider-Man, unfortunately passing away last week at the age of 90. Josh, any last thoughts on this? No, I mean, I just encourage everyone, even in pop culture, there's people who just read headlines. So a lot of people who aren't really as deep into the world as we are, they might come across a headline and see oh, Stan Lee did this. And, you know, they know things from what they read on headlines, Stan Lee, Steven Spielberg, stuff like that. But I encourage you to dig a little deeper because sometimes your favorite, you know, your favorite heroes, your favorite storytellers, your favorite novels, they have a a history that's a lot deeper than what you think. Like I was talking to my dad earlier today and we were talking about Pulp Fiction novels, the genre of Pulp Fiction. Anytime you talk about Pulp Fiction, they're like, oh, the, the uh, Quentin Tarantino movie. And that's kind of ruined the fact that a lot of these like, great writers you have robert e howard and edgar rice burroughs you have stories you have conan you have tarzan you have solomon kane a lot of these novels like these writers they so heavily influenced modern storytelling and comic books i i would oh i would go even far as to say that like people like superman and our uh, and our modern heroes even a bit of star wars might have had a little bit of influence from stories like john carter of mars and conan the barbarian those types of stories and we just we take for granted that kind of thing. You know, you go back and there's just such great stuff out there that nobody reads because nobody talks about it ever. I agree with you on that. And no, you know, it's not spoken very much of delving into those past great works that are out there that, like you said, influence a lot of what we have come to know in pop culture that was emanating in the seventies and eighties and nineties that, took from a previous generation of great pulp fiction work that's out there so if you get a chance check that out and also if you get a chance check out the actual storylines and comic books that steve ditko had a hand in writing in like the beginning series of dr strange or the original series of spider-man and get a chance to learn more about the history of where those two great characters came from because you're going to be seeing them real soon in 2019 as part of, well, almost likely in, in both those cases. But as we know, another Spider-Man Homecoming is being already, it's already in production at this point in time. And we know Doctor Strange, that's already been greenlit for another sequel in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for Doctor Strange. So the creations of Steve Ditko live on, but these pulp fiction stories live on in other facets of our pop culture. And it's up to you out there. And hopefully you get a chance to check out all of this great work from the past and understand why these things that we love so much now and where they came from and what influences they had and making them so good today. If you have any thoughts out there on the passing of Steve Ditko and want to share your thoughts, 
Hey, no problem at all. Please share it with us. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Also as well, PopCultureCosmos, Humana Comedia, and Game Source on Facebook and Twitter as well. Well, we've got a lot of great things that we've got in store for you coming up in future episodes. Like, first off, on Friday, we're going to be talking about The Rock's new movie, Skyscraper, also as well, Hotel Transylvania 3. Those are coming up as far as great movies. But also, we've got Comic-Con on the way, Evo on the way, and we've got a lot to look forward to in pop culture. The summer's not over yet, and there's a lot more left to do. Josh, any last thoughts on the way out? No, I think I'm good. I'm going to go see Ant-Man tomorrow, and I'll chat with you a bit about it on the next episode. All right. Sounds good, my friend. That truly sounds like a plan indeed. So for Josh Peterson, this is Euro Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the pop culture cosmos. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great day. Okay, auditions for the new Earth Station Who co-host. Take one. Go ahead. Hello, Stonehenge, who takes the Pandora Cup, takes the universe. But, bad news everyone, cause guess who? Ha, listen, you lot you're all whizzing about. It's really very distracting. Could you all just stay still a minute because I am talking? Not too shabby. Can you close this up? Earth Station Who, a fun mashup celebrating over 50 years of the Doctor Who universe. You never know where the TARDIS is going to go next. Earth Station Who podcast can be found at www.earthstationwho.com. Earth Station Who is a proud member of the ESO network. We are up on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher Radio or wherever fine podcasts are found. Peace and we are done. Did I pass the audition? We'll get back to you. Next. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. TangentBoundNetwork.com Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.